Hello, everyone. My name is Gam McDonough, and I'm the Educational Action Supporting Officer at ERN Eurobloodnet. And I'm happy to welcome you to the third session of the Genomed for All and ERN Eurobloodnet's educational program on artificial intelligence and hematology for an expert audience. This collaboration with Genomed for All is the result of many years working together since 2021. And this year's program aims to increase awareness of the cutting edge advances of artificial intelligence and its implications in the field of hematology. On that note, I'm happy to introduce our speaker for this third session, Nathan Lee, topic being regu regulatory framework. Nathan Lee is the data protection officer and information governance lead for the European Institute for Innovation to Health Data, IHD. He has focused his work on operational security and design implementation and he has an interest in understanding the legal, ethical, and societal impacts and concerns about novel health data uses, particularly in the area of artificial intelligence for health management and genomics research. Nathan also works part-time for Cancer Research UK as their trusted research environment lead and worked among, among many other important roles as a senior research fellow at University College London where his research and teaching focus on understanding legal, ethical, and security requirements for big data-driven clinical research. And with that introduction, I hand the floor to you, Nathan. Thank you very much for joining us, and uh, I wish you a wonderful presentation. Wonderful. Thank you very much, Gavin, and for the lovely introduction. Um, and uh, I'm looking forward to um, uh, talking about the Genome Ed for All journey and how we've worked with other collaborators uh, to uh, drive success in exploring the use of AI in healthcare research and intervention. So good morning, everyone. It's my pleasure to be here with all of you. And as Gavin has introduced me, I um, uh, I uh, will, will, will start straight off on uh, the session, uh, which we've uh, called, given the tantalizing title, Regulatory Framework. So what I'm hoping this morning is to actually uh, go through the um, the story of Genomed and its experience being at the uh, forefront of um, applying um, the latest in technical innovations in areas of rare disease research and trying to enhance not only discovery, but also um, do our best to support um, better outcomes for uh, patients and the citizenry. So I'll be speaking from the experience that we've had more than anything, um, and also relating it to how the regulatory frameworks are shifting and evolving, which I'm sure you're all very much aware of. But we've had to root our approach in what we know is, are the baseline requirements um, for um, achieving um, impactful, lawful and equitable research, uh, but also with a view on achieving excellence in that so that we're better able to adapt to what's coming um, down the line or indeed has already arrived. So. I'll speak for probably about 45 minutes or so, um, and then we'll have time for questions and answers. But um, feel free um, to add any questions you want me to answer in the chat whilst I'm speaking, and I'll keep an eye on it. So if there's anything that I can pick up on straight away, I'll do that. Uh, but we'll have plenty of time to talk later on. So without further ado, um, Today, when I'm speaking, uh, I'm going to just briefly introduce uh, myself, my home institution. Gavin's already done a stellar job on uh, on introducing me. But then I'm going to set the scene for you on um, what uh, Ginomed started in with regards um, context and uh, the times uh, three or four years ago, um, but also how that has changed and how it's evolving. Then we'll go through its journey um, from uh, inception, even um, proposal, then inception, and to date, as uh, the project is um, nearing its um, it, its last few uh, months. Um, but I do want to focus on the changing landscape as well from the regulatory perspective, because as we all know, we've had landmark legislation come in across Europe, uh, the European Union and with other third countries uh, working towards um, having similar regulations as well. Um, and I am going to focus uh, quite a bit on the AI Act, on the AI Act um, partly because it's the most pertinent to what we've been achieving in Genomed, but I'm not going to ignore other things like the European Health Data Space, which I believe will come into fall. It was, sorry, forgive me. It'll be enacted sometime this week. Um, and... Um, uh, that's uh, that's also got implications for um, data-driven innovation moving forward. So I will give a nod to that, but the focus will be on the AI Act. 
Then I want to leave you with uh, some food for thought about what to take away from our experiences and how um, our innovation sector um, should be gearing up for the future to make sure that we achieve regulatory compliance, but most importantly, we achieve richness of results and interventions as well. And like I said, there'll be time for a Q&A too. So my uh, main affiliation is with the European Institute for Innovation through Health Data, which um, Gavin mentioned. I act as the data protection officer and the information governance uh, lead in the research and innovation, uh, research and development side of things. So um, IHD is a not-for-profit membership organization where we are pleased to have members from across all the main stakeholders in health data-driven innovation, everything from academic institutions to healthcare providers to life sciences and tech industry, and most importantly, patients and patient associations and citizen representative groups. So we are, as we say in the UK, a broad church of members. We have many different perspectives, many different um, uh, considerations, many different concerns, and also goals and ambitions. But we maintain neutrality across this stakeholder group. Um, so we are there to encourage and enhance um, the value and the impact of data-driven research. Um, and we try to do it from um, a, a neutral basis whereby we, we don't want to pitch too uh, favorably to one stakeholder group at the expense of another. So there's a balance there. Um, we're registered in Belgium. Our head offices are in the beautiful city of Ghent, which I highly recommend uh, a visit to. I'm based in London, but today I'm um, uh, representing a Belgian organization and a multinational uh, one at that. Um, so um, we're based there. And like I say, we're all about making sure that we find the optimal uses of health data, health insights, um, increasing aware that the citizen is um, at the center of this and has so much more to contribute than technology, legislation and procedures and processes have allowed for in the last um, uh, several decades. So there is a real shift in uh, attitude, which I'm going to mention in my talk around uh, making sure that the citizen and the patient are an equal partner in these kinds of engagements. Now, Gavin's already introduced me, uh, just to pick out a couple of additional points. Um, I'm here representing IHD, of course, and our work on Genomed. My insights from my experience in um, UCL as a senior fellow, but also um, as um, working for the NHS as an information governance manager and one of the largest trusts in the UK. Um, I'm going to refer back to those experiences from a few years ago. Uh, my time at CRUK is coming to an end at the end of the year, um, but um, so that I can focus on the international work. Uh, but that's been a really useful journey as well in terms of policy development and consideration, uh, as well as um, interactions with other international partners. So, but I also act as a patient representative for one of the larger trusts, um, uh, uh, data trust committees about the reuse of health data um, within uh, hospital networks. So um, UCLH is a, a network of 12 hospitals um, as part of one large NHS trust. And there's a patient of UCLH for the last um, uh, 40, but if even last say 20, I don't want to give them away my age too much there. Um, uh, I bring that perspective as well. So when I think about the work we do, I do have the patient um, experience of mine being a type 1 diabetic uh, for the last, uh, in fact, 40 years. So I try and temper um, uh, devotion to tech and legislation with the real politic of living with a chronic disease as well. But everyone's insight on that is welcome. Let's set the scene a little for um, Genomed, our experiences and what we've worked with in the last few years, which has been an exciting, interesting time off the back of the COVID pandemic, but also with the advent of uh, faster developments and technological developments with AI in particular, as well as other expectations about citizen empowerment as a priority for Europe in general. Um, we've um, negotiated not only uh, newer legislations or more recent legislations like GDPR, which is only, what is it now, seven years old, I believe, um, six years old even, uh, you know, that's everyone was bedding that in when all these other changes were forthcoming as well. So I wanted to put across what we've um, experienced. 
So thinking about it, that evolving regulatory landscape in particular, like I mentioned, we've had, uh, and I've only cherry picked a few of the major uh, uh, European wide uh, regulations here, and I'll do a deeper dive into local jurisdiction shortly. But um, we had general the general data protection regulation arrive in 2018. And broadly speaking, this sent shockwaves throughout all industries about the use of personal data. I like to think of it as the best PR campaign anything has ever had because everyone was talking about data protection law, which was a new uh, a new one. Uh, everyone from um, people on the ground within all sectors through to the public, through to um, everyone who's um, involved in handling any sorts of personal data, everyone was talking about it. And uh, a lot of people were getting very nervous. But broadly speaking, the health and academic sectors and the life sciences sectors were actually pretty well prepared because, um, frankly, we'd all been doing things to quite a high standard in terms of protecting data with the consideration of medical confidentiality and so forth. But nevertheless, it's not been an easy ride and um, it has caused everyone to reflect, especially when you're collaborating with less experienced industries in this area as well. So GDPR was a seismic shift. And we all know that with our own experiences that that caused a great deal of refocus on um, how GDPR would land in line with conducting um, health driven research and providing care services. So it is there and there have been various success stories, some over interpretation of law and so forth. But we barely had time to catch our breaths um, as other laws started to come in. Um, one area that I want to mention is the Data Governance Act. Uh, which um, provides for um, the, a, a, a different paradigm in terms of data use, not just personal data use, which is what GDPR focuses on. But this is very much more about encouraging and supporting the digital single market in terms of sharing information and the development of this paradigm of uh, data intermediaries who could act on behalf of companies or indeed the citizen to hold data, particularly data related to them. So health data intermediaries are an important development of this in particular, because this is a basis upon which um, the citizen can engage more with their health service providers, as well as their tooling providers, their app developers, their smart watches and um, wearables and so forth to integrate data better, and then look to see how they can improve their lifestyles, their health conditions, and um, uh, the way that they live with their conditions as well. So. That's an important paradigm as well, but it does ex extend the interests of the citizen more about controlling their own data in this paradigm when GDPR put a great emphasis on having the, f uh, the better flow of information in a protected way, but it did make organizations more protective by and large around sharing data, including with the citizen, which can get uh, complicated, especially in the health and research sector. But that's to bear in mind what we've been dealing with as um, we've moved uh, through uh, Genomed as well. That's a new paradigm. So the AI regulation, I'm going to talk about much more later on in uh, this morning. But um, that's come about, um, I would argue, probably relatively quickly, actually. I think when Genomed for All was first proposed um, some years ago, AI regulation was uh, an apple in lawmakers' eyes. So uh, looking at the um, uh, the nations around the world, um, Europe's got the most rigorous regulation with the AI Act, but they're not the first. China was actually the first to introduce laws on AI and its use, um, sharing concerns across the world that AI was um, uh, gathering pace and we didn't have a good basis upon which to um, regulate it understand it, quality assure it, and so forth. But Europe's turned it around rather quickly in a framework that does require that kind of assessment. And this is fed into how we've managed Genomed for all. I'll speak about that a little bit more moving forward. But um, indeed, with um, these kinds of AI regulations, we see other nations are coming up to speed on them as well. So Europe's not the only one uh, by any means, um, but it has also sent a, a kind of preemptive shockwave for how we do things. Um, even though uh, for about a decade or so, with AI gradually gathering pace um, in the uh, early noughties, um, uh, 2010, 2011, uh, ethical considerations drove 
how it might be regulated. And there's a history there, which I'll go into very briefly as well. But we, like I said, I don't want us to forget the European health data space either, because that's a very important piece of legislation with regards to how we handle information within the health sector, uh, make it available for use and reuse in uh, primary and secondary settings, um, and also imposing much more of a rigorous regulatory requirement on things like the FAIR principles, findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable principles, because there's a requirement now in terms of uh, managing um, data storage, uh, data models, interoperability approaches, and so forth. So a lot of the standards that we may be familiar with over the years, HL7, OpenEHR, ISO 13606, you know, these, these are important uh, bedrock EHDS compliance, as well as raising questions around the uh, development of data spaces at national and regional levels but also debates around whether the citizen wants to be a part of this or not. So considerations about opt-in and opt-out. This is all fed into discourse around the reuse of information, uh, the use of information for healthcare and the involvement of partners from public sector to private sector as well. So the other thing to remember with these changes that are coming to play is that we've got existing uh, uh, national level laws as well. So for member states in Europe and third countries and indeed former member states, everyone has a, a regulatory tradition um, and requirements that go to things like medical professional confidentiality, uh, the governance of research as well in particular, which we will talk about, human rights, as well as provisions for genetic materials. And every country inside the EEA and some outside the EEA have a, have a different approach to this. Some um, are regulated by statute, so that's laws written and ratified by parliaments and, um, um, and uh, lawmakers. Um, but there's also common law traditions across some of uh, uh, member states, some European nations that rely more on precedent and rulings by judges uh, themselves. So it's not a, a simple tapestry. But thinking about this, that's the sort of scene that we're trying to work with here. And when it boils down to it on the ground, what these this means is that we have to look at all this as a tapestry of governance. So I've used the Bayo tapestry to illustrate the point. You can have a global view of the requirements, broadly speaking, and for projects like Genomed that involve multiple partners across multiple nations, you have um, uh, an additional challenge that uh, it's quite a vast and um, awesome uh, tapestry of governance that we have to abide by, but you do have to look at the detail of it as well sometimes. And with um, uh, I was uh, just saying to our team uh, before everyone arrived, um, I've been uh, especially grateful for working with the partners in Genomed for All, who've all been collegiate, um, expert, excellent, and um, so helpful in being able to tease out those details of local regulatory compliance, because they're different across every nation, like I say, even within regions and within clinical sites. The um, processes and procedures should all achieve broadly the same um, outcomes across these nations. But they have different procedures and they do have different rulings as well, especially when you think about research ethics committees and oversight advisory boards, as well as the procedures within um, the different uh, cohorts and contexts. So the processes in Spain uh, are similar, but have their own specific approach. And they differ to say the Netherlands, for example, or Italy, that they all try to reach a, a similar standard in terms of protection. But that's the reality of it. Um, you know, we, we are juggling a great deal of movement in that space. So Genomed, um, I think it's important to have a little bit of time just to think through what this meant. Ginomed was um, a um, was was an ambitious and important um, uh, proposal. Um, we were looking at particularly sensitive areas of research, but like I was saying, um, it is a multinational study uh, program conducted um, a series of studies and um, with different processes, procedures and expectations and different languages as well. So that's an important thing to bear in mind. But uh, we were also dealing with um, health data, sensitive data, 
um, about individuals from rare disease cohorts as well. So um, in terms of keeping the anonymity of participants, that's a bigger challenge in rare disease cohorts because there are fewer people who are um, actually uh, actually have the conditions. So their profiles might be easier to um, review and share and then re-identify. So there are those considerations there as well. And when you've got um, the um, uh, these kinds of issues as well as the um, genetic uh, data uses and images, there is a, a, a huge technical challenge that uh, we need to bear in mind when um, uh, we're trying to protect this information, but also deal with the sensitivities around rare disease cohorts for people who are uh, chronically unwell and with um, these various conditions. So sickle cell disease, multiple myeloma and minor dysplastic syndrome um, uh, are always um, areas that don't have a huge amount of um, data in terms of population, uh, which raises its own challenges, but are also representing um, a smaller cohort as well. So those sensitivities need to be considered. But in the midst of all of this potential um, complexity, uh, we were applying cutting edge technologies as well. So the omics processing side of things is still relatively recent, whether it's genomics, metabolomics or proteomics. There are considerations there on how best to um, process samples to generate data and insight, um, but also the considerations around the use of genetic material and, and um, human tissue material as well. There's a, a much higher expectation around the governance of those materials. And then we throw AI into the mix, which we all know has uh, a lot of consideration challenges around safety, equity, autonomy, um, and representation, to name but a few. Um, but given that these were images and genetic data using advanced um, analytics uh, with uh, AI, there was a large data processing need as well in terms of the um, technical setup of the um uh, hardware components. It was high volume, high throughput, high frequency processing. So the technical challenges were not um, uh, to be ignored either. And in the midst of all this, we had the shifting regulatory landscape, as well as those anxieties around novel technologies, people's rights, but also how useful this work would actually be, because none of it is particularly cheap in terms of technology or indeed the processes. Um, but um, we had to meet all those key stakeholder expectations and uh, requirements as well from the citizen, the patient, all the way through to the regulatory bodies, um, not forgetting everyone in between, including the researchers and technical um, partners, as well as the uh, life sciences partners. So how did we attack this? I think the first thing we recognized in Genomed uh, was that, um, you know, uh, Data protection and um, ethics have been legislated differently. A GDPR does not impose any kind of uh, ethical consideration. It imposes a requirement in terms of lawfulness. So you only get uh, lawful research if um, a uh, an ethics committee or an independent review board has approved the research in the first place, of course. But the way that the GDPR was written and laws relating to research governance and ethics were written were that they, you know, never the twain shall meet. Neither of them were built to necessarily interoperate with each other. So the first thing to consider was where GDM, uh, forgive me, GDPR was coming in, in terms of the data processing, um, identification of responsibilities for controllers, um, looking at risk management through data protection impact assessments and so forth. Um, looking at compliance for each of the articles of GDPR through the DPIAs, you know, these were all required and thinking about things like the lawful basis for processing, you know, not everyone has the same lawful basis, really. Some uh, jurisdictions favor consent, others favor public task. That's a whole seminar in and of itself. But um, it was also focused very much on the rights and freedoms of the individual. And whilst um, it was came from uh, represents the European Commission back in 2017 at an EMA meeting where they said, with GDPR, it's a common sense law about data protection. It does not legislate for ethics. That's a member state competency. Um, you know, GDPR was rather cleverly drafted to make sure that the ethical considerations could be leveraged as part of making the research lawful. 
So thinking about the rights and freedoms of individuals, those align very well with um, how um, the research um, governance worked in effect. So that included the um, provision of uh, informed consent forms and so forth um, pre-GDPR, so they could align quite nicely. So um, we recognize in GNMED that GDPR and ethics must go hand in hand. There was no um, reason to keep them as separate entities. And indeed, a lot of ethics committees want oversight of our GDPR compliance as well, which um, is an interesting uh, situation. It occurs in some jurisdictions, not others. Very often, ethics committees think consider the ethical implications and it's actually uh, data protection officers and the information governance teams within data controller and processor uh, entities and organizations that take a view on the data protection. So things move backwards and forwards um, very um, uh, rapidly there. So it, that was something we recognized from the outset. Not every jurisdiction had the same approach. Everyone had different specific requirements, but ethics and GDPR needed to work together. So when it boils down to it, I've covered a lot of what's here already. Um, we took a um, view on how to best um, approach this. We looked at the data protection by design default approach uh, as handed down by GDPR that said, bring in data protection concerns from day zero when you're developing something new in the broadest sense. And GDPR then works quite nicely because it makes you think about those research governance requirements. It makes you think about reuse of information. It makes you think about um, uh, how um, they must work in harmony as well. So I will go into a little bit more about the specifics shortly on how we've addressed these matters. But broadly speaking, like I say, there are different interpretations of uh, European law as well. So GDPR is certainly the case uh, in point. And um, it, um, when it comes down to it, our partners, our data source partners, either required as clinical sites, fresh ethics committee approval um, for the prospective studies, or in some cases for the registry side of things, we already had the approvals in place for the retrospective uh, studies, but uh, at different stages. So we had to adapt to each of the requirements, but we could do that using a data protection impact assessment that covered the entirety of the project. And that would inform the individual data controllers of how to do their own DPIAs. Um, and that uh, made us make sure that we mapped all the data flows and we understood um, who the partners were and what their governance requirements were from the outset. And that was really important to be able to effectively apply for ethics approval, but also engage with our participants as well and reach a high standard of engineering and data protection uh, on the basis that we were rigorous in applying the DPIA approach. But um, when it came down to it, this all worked back into our data management plans as well about open data, open science, and the FAIR principles that I mentioned um, that uh, we uh, had to develop a strategy for early on, and that was so vital. So um, I've already talked a fair bit now about the evolving um, regulatory landscape, but um, just very briefly to pick out those points that, um, uh, that I haven't covered quite so much. Um, we, um, we did, like I say, use GDPR really as the kind of driver for how we adapted to the regulatory framework and requirements. But along the way, aside from developments in the AI Act, the European Health data space and so forth, the existing considerations around um, uh, clinical trials directive and the forthcoming regulation, but also the medical device regulation formed an important part here. And when I mentioned the AI Act, that's quite an important thing to bear in mind because when you get to a point within a project or an, a venture where you've got something that you actually want to um, bring to market, you have to go through the certification procedures and so forth. And with that in mind, by applying the GDPR mandated approach, we were able to keep uh, documentation and records about our approach and our processes that would make any such application easier in the future. But in the middle of all of this, of course, earlier on in the project, before the AI Act really got traction, there were international efforts on developing um, ethical principles for um, the use of AI. And a lot of those principles have distilled down now into law as I'm going to mention. 
but it was all it was important bringing all of this together um to make sure that from the outset addressing Ginomed's challenges and how we were going to approach that this would a, uh, be able to provide us with the strategy and the key um um and the key milestones that we had to reach uh, for the project to make sure everything was um in line with regulatory expectations but we but we could future proof somewhat as well as the laws changed so i've um gone through the setting of the scene just now and i'm going to pause for just a minute just in case there are any burning questions i haven't seen the the chat um flare up if anyone's got any burning questions we can we can answer now or we can bring it back later on um in the uh, presentation well, uh, hello. Hi, Federico. We can hear you. Thank you. So, thank you for the talk. And uh, I, I can leave the topic of the question. <clears throat> so, you can choose if you want to answer now or leave it for after, maybe. But Thanks. my concern is about uh, algorithmic uh, compliance. So, the part of compliance and uh, responsibility assessment and impact that should. Uh, uh, be related not to the collection and to the choice of data, but uh, to the uh, choice of the algorithm and to the um, design of the mathematical and statistical model. So I, I would like to know possibly where we are at and uh, if there are some uh, um, groups in the world that uh, we can look at for uh, keeping aware on the topic so thank you thank you very much federico um and i i think my answer is um you're about to find out is the answer i i, I do touch on this um as i explore the ai act and we can go into more detail um when uh when, when we reach the discussion uh section in about 15 minutes but thank you for the question it is an important one and that's one of the biggest challenges really is how do you distill down all of these requirements into assessing the algorithms and their function themselves. So I will come uh, be speaking about that as uh, the uh, presentation continues. So I'll refer now to how we approach things. So I have already spoken to these points quite a lot already. Uh, I preempted my slides as is often the way. But uh, like I say, we went for the data protection by design default approach to GDPR. And that just to highlight a few things, um, aside from using templates that have been tried and tested either by the European Commission or by the um, uh, or by use within research and innovation projects, we had a data management plan template and a DPIA template as well. Um, but we supported all the partners from a common reference with the DPIA so that they could develop their um, templates for informed consent and for patient information leaflets as part of the ethics reviews um, consistently. Um, and that was uh, really important because each of those templates would have to be translated into the local um, uh, language, mainly spoken language of each of the clinical sites moving forward. So by taking that approach, that was useful in terms of expressing that. But this does come back into um, the uh, provenance of how not only AI tools are developed, but also how they're applied and the use of the actual algorithms themselves, because you have to be very context aware with the compliance requirements and the development requirements, which I'm going to come back to. So thinking of Federico's question, that's really important to bear in mind. But this effort helped us document and plan, in effect, and establish the strategy moving forward that was iterative over um, working with local sites on their approvals, as well as working with the technical teams to establish their security provisions, as well as the access to data. And in fact, the project had looked at a centralized data repository to do the work, but then opted for a federated learning model on the basis of some of the risk management that we did together and the necessity and the requirement for access to raw data versus the training of algorithms at the local sites where um, no data would need to be shared outside of the protection of that individual site that acts as a data controller for that individual data. So that was all really important uh, to consider. 
but we needed to understand very quickly um, the relationships and requirements um, for um, GDPR compliance. And in terms of looking at the baseline data protection impact assessment, like I mentioned, this allowed for us to work collegiately uh, through complex matters. So we determined fairly early in the project that actually um, the Genomed Consortium was made up of joint controllers uh, of the data with um, shared responsibilities, but also shared interests in the outputs of that data. And that was in line with other rulings around large consortial working. So we that on that basis, we could put together our uh, data sharing agreements um, as joint controllers uh, expediently, but also identify who in the consortium were only processors and sub processors, which would then uh, allow for contracting on individual levels as well. So we applied one joint control agreement for each of the three use cases because of the variation in data use and outputs and expectations. But it also helped us develop um, the codes of conduct and more rigorous information um, about informed consent forms and the information leaflets that I mentioned uh, that could be translated to. And again, this is all going to be really important to consider when we think about the AI Act, as well as the uh, training of algorithms and their use. So we um, also, because it was quite a disparate project, many partners over many nations, we assigned an ethical advisory board to have an overall oversight of the GDPR compliance, as well as the ethical matters. Now, they don't have power to uh, provide approvals, but they can support from a global perspective and an independent perspective, because they're a group of experts um, that were able to actually tease out some of the wider um, issues, but because they were focused on the implications of AI and its regulation as well, um, they recommended the use of the assessment list for trustworthy AI framework to do an initial assessment of um, Genomed and to understand the specifics there. So this was um, good timing as well, because most of what's in the Altai assessments have gone into the AI Act for high risk compliance as well. So with that in mind, um, this changing landscape, particularly the AI Act itself, um, this is where we are now today, more or less, after going through uh, evolution of regulatory requirements and expectations. So from that basis, I'm going to speak very briefly about the AI Act, mindful that there are others, as I mentioned early on in the talk. So broadly speaking, uh, the assessment list for trustworthy AI, or ALTI, was really uh, vital to help gear us up. And about three, two years ago, we started to look at this as it was being um, enforced, uh, not enforced, as it was being developed as an online toolkit. But the focus points here uh, were looking at the autonomy of the individual user or citizen, human agency and oversight um, as to the operation of the AI and the algorithms themselves. So you need to tease those apart to get a sense of where things are at with regards um, the actual decision-making process, which has implications for GDPR as well. Obviously, technical robustness and safety, security uh, through those kinds of areas are very much in line with what DPIAs and data protection and security requirements establish, including privacy and data governance as well. So there's a lot of work there that was vital. Uh, with regards to uh, data protection to gear up for the compliance and also understand how algorithms would interact and work. Um, then there's also accountability around the operation of the algorithms themselves, which stems from what we learned through the data protection impact assessments that we performed throughout the project. Um, but things about uh, transparency, um, uh, you know, there's very much a, an emphasis on this through GDPR anyway. So we were geared up about being transparent around data use but then the operation of algorithms and AI is also important as well and part of the regulatory requirements. You have to be clear when uh, AI is at play and what it's doing, whether it's making a decision or whether it's um, actually just giving an indication and a recommendation. But then there are other things that weren't so well touched on, one of them being uh, environmental considerations and societal well-being. Um, running AI burns a lot of energy. And there are questions about 
the environmental sustainability of that kind of activity as we know there are different regulations coming in around environmental impact and so forth so the altai and the ai act both have considerations around um how you're actually uh, running your system and your infrastructure but then there's also societal considerations so is the use of our algorithms going to put people out of work is the most uh, pressing concern in particular and how does that impact the marketplace and the jobs provision as well so those are things that GDPR and research governance don't um, help gear you up on. But the other aspect that um, uh, AI has brought about is also considerations around uh, data quality, completeness, accuracy, as well as bias in the data as well. Bias on either on the basis of uh, better um, treatment for some conditions against others, variations in, how, in demographic experiences with healthcare and so forth. Whereas before that wasn't necessarily legally mandated, it is now. We need to have a sense of uh, data sets and their bias and what impacts that will have on the training and development of algorithms and then their use in practice. So you have to have that continuously reviewed. So what I've done here is covered most of what's in the AI Act as well as the Altai and the assessment that we put together um, for the Altai for Genomed. And those are the important considerations to make. Now, I won't uh, dwell on this too much, but um, we know that the AI Act uh, was enact, uh, enacted in August 2024. Most of the provisions will need to be complied with by 2026. There's um, an adaptation period, but it must be taken alongside with all these other uh, regulations that I've been talking about as well. So the operation of the algorithms, the operation of the system in context needs to be informed by those other regulations. But the AI Act does define, uh, in particular, um, a um, uh, the definition of uh, different risk levels for different interventions uh, with AI. So everything from negligible through to low to medium risk to high risk through to unacceptable risk, uh, the Act actually has definitions for. But the focus I'm going to give today is on the high risk scenario because um, Genomed um, is working in a high risk uh, scenario. The uh, the tooling should be considered high risk, uh, given that it's essentially um, looking at um, provision of uh, medical uh, device uh, implementations, decision making, service access, and so forth. But what I've just flashed up there very quickly is um, the um, are what usually uh, determine the high risk interventions for the AI Act. So here we have um, a few of the specifics that relate to um, uh, medical research in general, uh, obviously uh, any products, any service development and access to services, things like that. Medical research is keenly um, considered in that uh, for sure. But then we also in the health space look at, um, uh, you know, have uh, rely on critical infrastructure as well and research on how better to provide um, uh, access to things like remote apps and so forth and remote monitoring, amongst other things. So any AI that's involved in that needs to be considered. But then, frankly, uh, we also do a lot on educational, vocational training and so forth and research in those areas. Um, and actually, I think it's fairly clear to say that health impinges on all of these areas. So my message here is to say, assume it's going to be high risk what you're doing, um, and it's going to be regulated to that um, extent as well. Now, because time is a little short, um, I'll just briefly um, mention that the AI Act defines roles like GDPR does for uh, uh, data controllers, data processors. The AI Act has uh, various roles that are of relevance. The particularly important ones for us in the research, healthcare provision, innovation sector are obviously the user uh, side of it, because they're all users of the AI. But um, our providers, our health service systems, our research systems will be um, not only developing um, and uh, providing AI in particular, but they'll also be deploying it. And that's where a lot of, uh, Federico, your points, your question relates to. It's about understanding, especially for the developers of AI and the providers, that's where a lot of the um, oversight and assessment needs to be done against those seven uh, requirements that I mentioned just now. So the lion's share, the majority of the compliance aspects fall to the providers and the deployers, as well as the users. 
So we um, there are also um, provisions for any institutions that are providing AI systems outside the EU. So that's where importers, distributors, and authorized representatives come in. I won't dwell on that too much. But then they're the people who actually operate the AI and the individual, of course, who's affected by it that you need to consider. So those aspects are really important and those iterative assessments around explaining the role of the algorithms, how they're working, how they're operating is really important. So um, I mentioned before things like the medical device regulation and um, the um, certification requirements for that. The AI Act brings in another slant to certification requ requirements, CE marking and so forth. And um, if you want to bring one of these tools to market, you will have to go through a similar process as you might do for a medical device. Now, the notification authorities and the competent authorities are looking at aligning those processes at the moment. So there'll be guidance on that. But broadly speaking, the Act defines their role in this, where you have to notify of the intention to bring a product to market to notifiable authorities. And then um, you'll have um, uh, the assessments done in line with those seven requirements that I mentioned against specific criteria as you would for a medical device. So bear that in mind and hold that uh, uh, thought for a moment because this will be going ongoing with post-market surveillance as well and uh, oversight and codes of conduct, much of which stems from GDPR, but you know there'll need to be amendments to how you operate with AI and the algorithms and what they're doing in particular. So um, there's also, um, of course, hefty punishments for um, breaches of uh, the regulation. And it's important to bear in mind that uh, that can change. Uh, that can depend on the case law that's developed. GDPR is still developing case law, but um, they need to be um, assessed and will be prosecuted either by GDPR supervisory authorities or by um, specific branches of AI. Um, and um, the uh, Europe has its own AI board, like it does the um, Data Protection Board uh, for uh, oversight of the EU and EEA that will work with the authorities on the ground. So that's um, a whistle-stop tour of the AI Act itself, but what's really important are the requirements and how we um, approach them. So what can we take away from this? What's the important things that um, I want to highlight to all of you now? Um, Thinking about Federico's question at the nitty gritty level of uh, the algorithms and their operation, um, you have to know your context really well because it frames your assessment approach, but it gives you the knowledge, the accountability and the intelligence of how the AI components have been developed, the quality assurance that's been applied, but also who's responsible for what especially around the explaining the operation and the output of those algorithms. So it's so important to understand who's involved, what they're doing and how they're handling things, much as we've been done for Genomed. Um, it's been so vital to understand the data flows and the oversight requirements so that uh, we can risk assess. There's a quality management system in place and a risk assessment process and that will stand us in good stead for AI Act compliance. But that would be the case for any endeavor that's developing something that will fall under its scrutiny and providing trustworthiness for the AI. But this will also help you scope your approach. And to my mind, there are probably four areas of assessment. That's the contextual zone where we talk about the things that um, we've been uh, discussing. But then there's the development zone that I think is particularly important because that's where you focus on the processes and procedures for building the tools, training the algorithms, making decisions on the models that you're using and what you're generating and how they need to be adapted and updated, but also in thinking about testing the operation of those tools within the component framework of an overall tool. And then that can apply the specific criteria questions for development. Uh, at a higher level. Then you get into the use and deployment scenarios and the post-market surveillance, which themselves have um, different assessment requirements, as I've discussed, especially around the operation safety and robustness. But um, a lot of the work has to be done in the founding context of your initiative and its development, especially around robustness, governance and security and um, operation. 
but a lot of this comes down to best software engineering practices so um you know however good you are at um, building software you need to have a good sense of the quality and bias implications of your source data and your training data and how that's adapted as ai looks at it analyzes it generates models and then provides further lenses on that data and data that you feed it so documentation unit testing validation all of those understood aspects are vital in this case there's very much more emphasis on the context of data acquisition like i say where it came from and the, what level of quality it is it may be biased but you have to declare that it is and then you have to look at how that impacts how your algorithms work and your choice of um, algorithm usage but like i say um it's uh documentation heavy uh if you want to gear up for this so uh, gdpr helps us do a lot of this but not all of it. So the compliance there and the standard that the ethics committees demanded that we reach is very helpful in this, especially from the contextual side, but it can help guide the development moving forward too. But don't forget the AI Act works within a tapestry of other certification requirements. So the precise approach to this is as yet unclear. Now, I might stop it there because I know we've got uh, time issues. And um, I think I was just going to spend 30 seconds on a couple of cases in point as to why this kind of regulation is really important. You may be aware of um, the, um, in the United Kingdom, our postal service, the post office, deployed uh, a new system called Horizon in the mid nineties, and it didn't work well at all. Um, it's ended up uh, being misused and misinterpreted and people who were working for the post office sometimes ended up in prison because the system indicated they were stealing money. Now, all of this was wrong. Uh, when it came down to it. Uh, the system had no quality implementation metrics. Um, there was no um, uh, assessment and quality assessment. Use of the tool was not fully understood. Exactly the kinds of things that the AI Act is talking about have always been important when it comes down to it. But if you don't legislate for it and you don't oversee it properly, you end up with people being arrested and imprisoned when they didn't do anything wrong off the back of skewed data that couldn't be verified. But you also have had the judiciary being told, well, you have to assume that the system is correct. So there were legal arguments that basically meant they couldn't question it as much as they needed to. This has been an ongoing inquiry now for 20 years. And finally, the issues have been um, uh, uh, highlighted and ruled upon. So it's another lesson learned. But this is why the AI Act is really important. And the other case in point to bear in mind was the, uh, again, something that cropped up in the UK. We had in the 80s and early 90s issues around blood transfusion. We imported um, blood for transfusions, predominantly from America at the time, I believe. But in America, they didn't have quality checks in place. They weren't clear on the where the... Um, uh blood had been sourced from and by and large they would use um blood from vulnerable populations infected communities and so forth a lot came from uh, the homeless and from prisoners basically but no one knew that there was no documentation there was no established um declaration of that when the blood was imported and there were failures to test the blood properly um between the uk and the us uh where um uh, there was uh, it had been tainted with HIV, with Hep C, and so forth, uh, you know. But the quality control measures just weren't in place, and the report is due on that on that scandal. So this is an old, um, uh, an older example. But still, this is why we have these kinds of regulations, and this is why we have to be so careful about what data we choose to train algorithms and how. Um, they're used to um, actually deploy the algorithms as well, because um, when it comes down to it, when you start to make choices and decisions in the care setting on the back of the AI driven uh, aspects, you need to have tested it to make sure that it's actually producing things that are um, not harmful and useful um, for, for that intervention. So it's always good to look at other examples of where things have gone badly wrong, where quality is important. So on that note, I'm going to thank you. And I'm sorry, we have overrun a little bit. So I think I went into more detail as, as often is the case, but we'll um, have um, a, um, 
uh, 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 discussion question section now. And before I do that, very quickly, I'm just going to flash that um, there are a couple of conferences where we're going to be focusing on these issues in the coming three or four months. We have IHD's annual conference in Spain. Uh, details there, there will be an AI component to that for sure, and the implications of the AI Act and other areas as well uh, around European health data space. And in Paris, in a couple of weeks, we have the second European Health Data Protection Congress, uh, which um, uh, should be linked to uh, in the materials, uh, where we are going to be focusing a lot on the impact of AI on research and ethics. But um, let's move now to questions and comments. I'll leave that up just so people have a bit more time to have a look at it. But Gavin, I'll hand over to you. Um, and very quickly, Federico, did did I address most of your um, questions there, or do you want me to go into a little bit more detail? No, you addressed uh, very well my main concern. So thank you. And thank you. Uh, maybe, but this is just like a plus. Does it exist some sort of uh, playbook or a guide list for designing uh, uh, algorithms that are that try to be uh, compliant by design? Um, not yet is the answer. <clears throat> um, I, 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 I'm, uh, I'm, I, I should say. Um, so one of our last uh, deliverables for Genomed is going to incorporate some of those aspects and our deliverable from uh, last year on uh, initial compliance does point to uh, those aspects. But um, we are actually looking at um, developing that uh, that guidance within um, IHD uh, and as part of our project work as well. So in the meantime, I could put what I'd recommend is that you look at the um, European Commission Altai page um, and um, the um, the kinds of aspects there, because running through that for your um, intervention gives you a sense of what you need to be looking at as well. But uh, more detailed materials are forthcoming um, for uh, the the um, uh, for the uh, for a playbook on. Um, out, uh, you know, likely out of the box compliance. The issue you have though is that um, no one really knows how to um, do the assessment criteria for compliance yet. There's a very good idea, but we don't know how it's going to play with the other compliance requirements as well. And a lot of our work is on harmonizing those aspects too. So um, I think the materials that I've shared here are a good start. But there are others that um, uh, let you um, consider those kinds of aspects. But I've often felt that um, the uh, development communities aren't always the best served in terms of regulatory compliance, which is why I always make it an engineering paradigm that um, you institute these kinds of processes um, as best uh, you can from the outset of development. So more on this space. And I think... Um, I'm not sure whether we have your contact details, but um, I can give updates on how things are moving forward in that area as well. So I'm happy to keep the conversation going if you want to contact me at my email address here or um, uh, through uh, Gavin or the team, uh, then uh, we, we we can work together more on um, making that crystal clear. So perhaps with that, thank you so much, Nathan. Thank you once again for your time. Thank you all. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Gavin, and everyone for attending. It's been a pleasure.